I guess. She's not here yet, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Give me a 
podium with wheels on it this week, like she said she was going to. Um, so I'm just going to stand right here again. I'm just trying to hold stuff in my arm, but it still ain't working out very good. Um, last week, when we were here, we were looking at the ingenuity and the excitement and the anticipation of people who believed that Jesus could do something. Didn't we? They wouldn't let crowds stop them. They wouldn't let anybody get in their way. They went so far as to ruin somebody's roof by cutting a hole through it to drop a paralyzed friend by a rope down in front of Jesus so Jesus could help the man. Now, how many of you think the guy got more than he really anticipated he might when he showed up by that, by that, in that situation? And how many of you remember what the religious people said? They started thinking Jesus was a blasphemer. They started talking about him being a blasphemer. And, you know, he said, is it easier to forgive somebody's sins or say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk? And the guy didn't pause. He didn't even think about it. Jesus looked at him and said, get up, come on. He got up, picked up his mat, he jumped up. He jumped up. Now, this guy's been paralyzed all his life. Muscles were atrophied. Now, think about that. If Jesus can heal somebody physically who's never been able to do anything for themselves, what can he do for us spiritually when we begin to believe the lies that Satan tells us? When we get atrophied in our spirit, when we're in those days of walking in the wilderness, like we don't think God's going to be able to fix us or help us. You know, sometimes things just drag on and on and on and it gets harder to get up and face it every day. But God's strength is what gives us the ability to do that. And that's provided through what Jesus did on the cross. When we need healing in our spirit, Jesus can heal our spirit. When we need healing in our hearts, He can heal our hearts. When we need healing in our minds, He can heal our minds. And the best part of, it, of all this, He forgives our sins. Is anybody glad about that? Yes. He forgives our sins. Um, I've had a few conversations in the last couple of days with people... Who told me that believing in God's a fantasy? Um, you believe your fantasy? And, uh, you know, I think about that and I think, oh my. When my fantasy becomes the reality and their reality hits, they're going to wish they believed in my fantasy if that's what they think it is. But it is not a fantasy. Jesus raised from the dead. He's alive. He's coming back. He's got it in control. The Bible says that he holds it all together in his hand. And as we think about that, we're going to move just a little further into chapter 2 today. We're going to talk about a specific disciple that Jesus called. And do you know the Bible says that God calls each one of us? Anybody believe that? Yeah. You don't just wake up one day and say, think, I think I'll quit being a sinner. I think I'll just get right to get with Jesus if you don't know who he is. You can't do that. Because inside of us is the ability to sin. And some of us learned that pretty proficiently before we came to Christ, huh? Anybody? Yeah. Anybody beside me? Way good in sin before you came to Christ. That's why it's so hard to get rid of once you walk with Christ. Because it's your second nature. It's your nature. You know, that old dead nature's got to be put aside. And we're going to see that happen today. And we're going to see what happens when God changes somebody. There's always somebody there to be negative about it. Have you ever had that happen? Yep. Sure. And so, as we look at chapter 2 today... We're going to talk, talk about reaching people while rejecting religion. How many of you know, if you've been around here long enough, how much I hate religion? Anybody know that I hate religion? You know, there's that one song that we sing. There's a place where religion finally dies. I'm waiting for it to happen on these days in the world. But it seems like people are more and more religious and less and less in love with Jesus. Have you noticed that? There was a big article that came out about our president. Talking about what an amazing Catholic he is. While at the same time, all the bishops and cardinals in the Catholic Church are trying to find a way to keep him from getting communion because he's so pro-abortion. How can you be somebody who's okay with babies being murdered up until the time they're born and still be okay with God? How can you do that? It takes kind of monster to do that, doesn't it? That's an innocent life that's never touched or hurt or bothered anybody. And he says, he's, he's pushing, they're pushing to get it all the way up till even they can lay the baby up on the table and let the mother decide from there if they want to continue doing anything. That's murder. 
You can't be a good follower of Christ and be okay with even contemplating that, right? The Bible says if you've thought about it in your mind, you don't even have to do it. It's done. And if we think about that and we look at it, there are some pretty sick, twisted individuals who have come to Christ. Have you ever read the Bible? Hmm? Can I tell you that most people that read about it in the Bible did start out being goody-two-shoes? Anybody that God ever used overcame something to be used, right? But there came a time in their lives when they had to be called to Him. God called Abraham. Abraham left his home. And he came to follow God to a place that he didn't even know where he was going. But he believed in God enough to go there. Now, he came from a land where they believed in lots of gods. But God spoke to him and heard God and he began to follow God. And he was known as a faithful person, right? God considered him faithful. Moses, murderer, right? <coughs> Hiding out on the backside of the desert. All of a sudden he's walking around and he sees this bush burning. And he's thinking, oh my gosh, the bush is burning, but it's not on fire. It's not burning up. And he hears a voice, Moses. God calls him how? By name. Yes? Come on over here. Take your shoes off first, because this is holy ground. You know, there are a lot of people out there that don't treat their experience with God like it's a holy thing. We're way too casual about our understanding of who God is and what he wants. Do you know the same God who called Moses and who called Abraham and who spoke to Isaiah in a vision and who called Jeremiah and said, I don't care what people say. You go out there and tell them what I want you to say and don't let them hold their, your youth against you. And what else did he say? Like flint harder than steel have I made your head. Mine's a little hard. Gets me in trouble sometimes. Because it won't compromise on what God wants. But that same God who called them and the same Jesus who called the 12 disciples to follow him calls us today. He calls us today. He doesn't want us to be religious. He wants us to hear his voice. No amount of rites and rituals and rules and compilations of books on how you ought to do things will ever get you any closer to Jesus than just listening to him. Hear his voice right out of the scripture. He said this. He said, you can't even come to me unless you're called by my father. Think about that. And of all those that the Father gives me, I'll not lose one, but I'll raise them all on the last day. God doesn't give up on us either. So if we're here in chapter 2, we're going to read verses 13 through 17, and then we're going to go back and pack them, unpack them a little bit. Um, right after the paralyzed man, it says, then. Now remember, what's Mark in a hurry? He's in a hurry, right? He did this, then he did that, then he did this, and there's really no pauses anywhere. So he says, then Jesus went out to the lake shore again, and he talked to crowds that were coming to him. As he waited, walked along, he saw Levi, or Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home. As dinner guests, along with as many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But then the teachers of the relig of religious law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the tax collectors and the other sinners, and they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come not to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Have you ever met anybody in their self-righteous robes? Yes. Yeah. Self-appointed, self-righteous? Even their flatulence has no odor. <laughs> That's how holy they are. Have you ever been around anybody like that? Doesn't it make you want to just puke right on their feet? The problem is most of those people are hiding everything they do and they just put on that fake face and that fake mask and they go out and they make everybody believe they're somebody they're not. And that's why I say, when you look at somebody's life and you say, I wish that my life was like their life. No, you don't sometimes. 
No, you don't. Now, let's go back here just a little bit to the beginning part of this. And, you know, as most ministries enlarge, the participants look for a larger space to meet. Isn't that what happens? Churches start out and then they get a bigger building, and then if they're really, really growing, they will do several services, and then when they get a pot full of money, then they go out and build these multi-million dollar buildings, or they buy an old basketball stadium, or something like that, and they fix it all up, and they make church out of it. How do you think those ones that have those gazillion dollar debts did through the pandemic when nobody was coming to church? Because a lot of times when people don't come to church, their money doesn't come with them, right? And nobody ever makes it up, it seems. And as we look at this, how many more people do you think tried to get in that house after that, that guy who was paralyzed was walking and leaping and praising God and skipping down the road, carrying his mat, and telling everybody he saw because they all knew who he was because he used to lay by the road so he could beg. And now they see this guy and people are like flabbergasted. How in the world? What happened? Well, Jesus healed me. Woo! There you go. There's a big crowd. Can't stay in the house anymore. So Jesus moves out by the lakeside. And every time he goes out by the lakeside, the people crowd in on him so much, he's got to get out in the boat, or he's, he's got to get away from them. But he's out on the lakeside, and he's, and he's working his way out there because the crowds are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as we see this, Jesus, in the midst of those crowds, focused on individuals, even in the midst of a growing crowd. God knows your name. Isn't that amazing? Hello? God knows your name. He knows who you are. He knit you together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God knows you. You may fool other people, but you can't fool God. And you know, guys, there is nothing wrong with being willing to never, ever compromise on your faith in God. But there are too many people today who call themselves Christians who are really religious because they compromise everywhere they go. They don't stand up for what's right. They won't speak out against what's wrong. They don't do anything to actually even let anybody know that they're Christians except live a quiet life. Can I tell you that if you live a quiet life, that's okay. But Jesus didn't call us to live a quiet life, did he? He called us to make disciples wherever we went, to speak out for him, to be his people. To make sure that people know that we follow him and believe in him. And just because they're watching a silent movie doesn't mean they understand that. How many of you would rather go back from talkies to silent movies? Has anybody ever sat down and tried to watch a silent movie? I mean, it's all about facial expressions and they're over made up so that it really looks like something's going on. And then you get a little blurb where they just said 45 words to each other. You get a little one sentence saying out here in the middle. And then they jump to the next scene. You know, that's not what it looks like to live for Christ at all. And if Jesus loves you enough to call you by name, oh my goodness, how can we reject him? How can we stop following him? How can we not be so excited about who Jesus is that it just bubbles outside of us like if you shook up a can of Pepsi and opened it up? Right? Or threw a mento down in a bottle of 7 up or something like that. <coughs> there it goes. Why are we so. Silent, quiet, unexcited. Why? When we follow Christ. Watch what happens here in this story. Okay, they, they go out. Jesus left the house where he was recent, where he recently healed the paralytic to go out by the seashore. Not enough room, okay? Now, not everybody in that crowd that's following him is motivated to be his disciple, though. You hear what I'm saying? Some of them are just there to see what's going on. Some of them are there for the show. Some of them are there because it's something new. Some of them are there because everybody else is excited, so they got excited. And as we look at this, the crowds continue to come for healing and for teaching and out of plain old curiosity. I can remember the very first night we had church here at Cumberland Community Church. It was November 16th and 17th of 2003. We had a two-night grand opening. And in that two night grand opening, we had 167 people who showed up in the first two nights. We were a brand new church. Uh, we baptized 11 people that weekend who had come to Christ before we ever started meeting publicly. That's an awesome thing, let me tell you, to be able to have people who've given their life to Christ in the process of starting up a church. And after that first 
opening, we thought, man, wow. But you know what? More than half were curiosity seekers. Some of them thought I was my dad because we had the same name. And they're from out man's choice and places like that. And they knew my dad when he was growing up. And they thought he came here to start a church. And then they came and, oh, it's only the son. It's not him. Right? Um, other people came from other churches because they weren't sure what they were doing and they came to visit, but they left. And it took us up till Easter to get up to about 100 people. A steady 100 every Sunday morning. And even in the midst of that, I was looking at something on Facebook the other day. It was a reminder, one of those memory things. Anybody can get your memory things and come back up and tell you what you posted on a certain day. I had said on there, based on the two Sunday morning services, when we were having two services at that time, and the group that we reached at the college that week, we had 458 people in worship on a Sunday. 458. But you know, not everybody was a follower. And not everybody wanted to do it the way God's doing it. And not everybody wanted to be a part of a church that's a hospital, really. Does anybody see our church as a hospital? A place when you're broken and you come here. How many of you came here because you were broken and God's changed your life since you've been here? A few, right? That's what we've always been. It's always been a place where people can come and heal. Come and find Christ. Come and hear God call their name again. Because between the world and the devil and your own self beating yourself up, sometimes it can be a pretty horrible existence to be you, can it? And as we look at this, Jesus doesn't always call the pretty people. <laughs> right? I have a face for radio, there's no doubt about it. Jesus doesn't call the pretty people all the time. He calls the broken, and he calls the lost, and he calls those who have been hurt by the world and by other people. But all those that he calls are already looking for help. Do you believe that? I mean, we can talk to people all day long who don't want anything to do with God. Or we can find people who are broken and they know it and they're honest about it and they'd be willing to listen to the opportunity to hear about a God who loves them. A God who cares for them. A God who is gracious for them. A God who has mercy to pour into their lives. And his message hasn't changed. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And I told somebody that this week. I said, I'm, I'm praying for the day when God's grace and God's mercy and God's love comes into your life because you've repented of your sins and you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And the answer I got back was, you just keep your fantasy. I don't want anything to do with it. <clears throat> Who rejects grace, mercy, and love? Who? And salvation and hope for eternity. Who, really, who rejects that? And as we think about it and we look at it, I'm going to get my shotgun out in a minute before we <laughs> You guys are going to have to scatter because it's going to be boom right up there. And it'll be fixed. <laughs> well, look at verse 14. Jesus calls an unlikely follower here. Verse 14 says this. As he walked along, he saw Levi, or Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in his tax collector's booth. Now, how many of you, as you're walking along, are looking for a tax collector to invite to come be your friend? What has everybody of all time down through the ages thought about tax collectors? Boo! Right? Nobody, everybody's afraid of the tax man. Well, here's the deal with tax man and Jesus did. They collected taxes for the Roman government, and the Roman government allowed them to add a percentage onto what they were collecting for themselves that they didn't have to report to anybody. Nobody asked them how much it was. So Jesus is walking along, and basically here's this crook sitting here at the tax collector's booth, stealing money from people, right? But watch what happens. There must have been something going on in Matthew or Levi's mind. As you look at it, Jesus says, follow me and be my disciple, Jesus says to him. Now, it would be nice if we heard an audible voice saying, follow me, wouldn't it? I don't know about you, but there are times in my life where I'm not doing what God wants. And I just, I get this uneasiness inside of me. I get this thing that says, come back. Do what you're supposed to do. 
why aren't you doing what you're supposed to do? And I know it's the Holy Spirit spoken on the strings of my heart to get me to be and do what God wants me to be and do. And he doesn't want me to listen to the lies, and he doesn't want me to, you know, figure out if I just wait long enough, it'll go away. Because it's not like indigestion. You can't just take it out the cells before and it goes away. You deal with it. And it will be so nice. And one day we're wrong. One day. One day I'm going to kneel in front of Jesus. And he's going to look at me and say, Ron, you're home. You're home. Wow. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face. The one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand. And leads me through the promised land. What a day. Glorious day that's going to be. Wow. But until then I have to rely on God's word. And have to rely on the quiet times in prayer when the Holy Spirit impresses things on the mind. Here's this tax collector. He's sitting there. Jesus is walking by. He's got this crowd of people clamoring all around him. And he says, hey, come follow me. Now what do you think happened when everybody saw him get up from his table? When he got up from his table, it doesn't say, he said, Jesus, wait, I've got to pack all my money up so that I can get it ready to go with me. What did it say it did? So he got right up and he followed Jesus, just like the guy who jumped off the mat and started walking around. When we hear God speak our name, when we hear God do something that we're a part of, we ought to move right now. Because the longer we procrastinate, the easier it is to believe it was something else. Correct? I'm not lying, am I? I'm not the only one that's been there, am I? No. It says here, Levi got up and followed him. He just got up and left. And that's what God expects us to do. When Jesus forgives us of our sin, he expects us to just get up and walk away. Doesn't he? We don't need 12-step programs and read a book three ways of this and read 17 books about how you ought to do that. The scripture tells us what we need to know and how we ought to live for God. When there's sin in our life and God forgives us, we walk away from it. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Okay? And as we see this, later, which again, we don't know how much later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his house. Now, as we see this, Jesus is going to go have dinner with some sinners. There ought not to be a problem with that, right? Hmm. Matthew is despised tax collector. And now Jesus is going to go have dinner on sinners. You know what? All of us will die at one time. Weren't we? But see, the amazing thing is, now if we've asked God to forgive us of our sins, we used to be sinners. We still have the propensity to sin, but we used to be sinners, and we can arrive at a place sin no longer is our master. Isn't that an awesome thing too? That's amazing that God will give us the ability to have the strength to walk away from sin. How many of you in this room can honestly say, now I want you to raise your hands, that if you still do have a miscalculation or do something you shouldn't do, it's nothing like it was before you came to Christ. Anybody? Isn't it amazing how God not only changes us, but He changes our behaviors, He changes our pursuits, He changes the direction of our life, as long as we keep our eyes on Him and we're following Him. And Matthew invites Jesus and His disciples, because, you know, when you invite the pastor over, it kind of gives you special stand. Right? <laughs> not really. But everybody wants to be around a celebrity, Right? And kind of now, Jesus is a real celebrity. People are getting healed. Demons are being cast out. He's teaching like nobody else teaches. He's talking about God. He's talking about what it looks like to be in God's presence. And as we see this, Levi just didn't invite them. Look at the next verse. It says, well, he invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. The 49% that want to keep God in their guns. Those kind of people. You know, not the ones who are enlightened and woke. 
Real people. How many of you interact with real people every day? How many of you know real people need Jesus? How many of you know that they'll even admit that they wish their life would change? Yeah, they do. But sometimes they're not willing to take it to the next step. They're not willing to accept Christ. They'll hear about it. But guess what? It's not your job to save them. It's just your job to help them find Jesus. Then the Holy Spirit does the work. And you're there to help. You're there to continue to model it in front of them and help them understand why God loves them. Look at this. And see what happens. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. Does anybody know anything about Jesus' followers? Peter was a fisherman, but Peter chewed his mouth off at the drop of a hat, wouldn't he? There was a couple of them, Simon the Zealot. Does anybody know what a Zealot is? They were political people who were really involved in trying to get Rome out. And they thought he thought Jesus was going to be the one. There were some of them that were members of what they called the Sicarii. The Sicarii were people that walked around because they wore robes back then, and they tucked a real long slender blade up their, up their uh, sleeve, and as they were going to public things, if there was somebody there that they disagreed with, they would walk up beside them, sl slip that shiv out of there, and stick them in the ribs, put it back in, and walk away, and nobody knew who did it. That's what zealots did. You know, then we have Thomas who doubted Jesus, but that's not all he did. We, we kind of hanged him with doubting Thomas, but... He was one of the first ones to really acknowledge who Jesus was. And normal people, real people, people like us. James and John, they wanted to call down fire from heaven and destroy a bunch of people just because they were talking about Jesus and they weren't part of the in crowd. Think about that. And the woman who was caught in adultery, she followed Jesus. Some of the other people that followed Jesus, they didn't have very good reputations among the elites and among the religious people. I mean, believe it or not, since I've been in the ministry, I've walked into churches where I felt dirty because everything was all painted white and it was like this mausoleum for saints to hang around and, you know, uh, most of those people in there wouldn't say poo if they had a mouth full of it. I don't fit in that crowd. The kindest, best compliment that I can ever get is you don't look like a preacher and you don't act like a preacher. Because a preacher is that fishy, limp-handed guy that comes up and sees you when you're getting buried and sees you when you're getting married and you can never really get any answers out of him with these little Christian platitudes and he doesn't want to hear what's really going on in your life. He's sitting there giving you the answer before you get a chance to say what you need to say. That's not me. And you know the amazing thing was that's not Jesus either. That's what stuck out and made him so much different than the Pharisees. Jesus was a maverick. He was a he wasn't a troublemaker, but everywhere he went, there was trouble from the religious people. Have you ever read the stories? They're there. When you stand up against religion, you're automatically wrong. And Jesus didn't come to be religious. He came to introduce us to God's love, agape love. Anything else is short. And as we see this, Jesus has followers who are like these people. Levi, who was a tax collector, is invited to his house. He's invited other tax collectors to be there. But what do we tell people today when they get saved? Don't go hang out with those people anymore. They'll be a bad influence on you. If nobody that believes in God is hanging out with people that don't believe in God, how do people that don't believe in God ever find their way to Jesus? What's it say in Romans? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How are they ever going to hear if nobody opens their mouth to talk? Paraphrase. I mean, we encounter lost people all the time, don't we? We have to learn how to make the conversation move from whatever the weather, the kids, you know, how bad things are, what you had for dinner, to more spiritual things. We've got to find a way. And the biggest way that I've found to be able to find and talk to somebody like that is listen to them. Listen to their heart. Listen to what they say. Because what's inside of people is what comes out of people. Isn't that what Jesus said? And watch people. Watch people. Not everybody has good motives to be part of a church or any organization. And as we think about it and we look at it, um, it doesn't say that Jesus was ashamed to hang out with those folks, does it? No, when Matthew invited him to dinner, Jesus liked to eat just like anybody else did. 
His first miracle was where? At Big Mary's feast. He was there as the honored guest at Mary's feast. You know, unless we think Jesus, you know, never ate and, and never used the toilet and never did any of those kind of things, he was real just like us. He had to be for us to be able to identify with him, right? We don't read about all that stuff, but we find out that he put on flesh just like us. And anybody that's flesh gets hungry, gets sad, is happy. Jesus grieved. He was happy. He rejoiced. He did all those kind of things because he was God in the flesh. And he set aside part of his deity so that he could experience life on this earth just like us. And you know, when we think about people, most people that are Christians within two years, <clears throat> used to be, I don't know what it is now, but within two years, they don't have any meaningful relationships with anybody that's not going to the church they're going to. They don't have real relationships outside of a certain few people because they've been told they're bad for you. Well, yes and no. If people are living a life of constant habitual sin and you try to talk to them about God and they just keep rejecting you and rejecting you and rejecting you, don't hang out with them. But there are people out there who wish they weren't driven to a drink. They wish they didn't have to take the next shot or the next bill. They wish they could get along with their spouse. They wish that they had an opportunity to love their kids better. And they need somebody who will come alongside them and walk with them and do more than superficial interaction. Do you know that 90% of what we do in the world is so superficial it doesn't make any difference? Anybody believe that? It's superficial. We really don't get to know anybody because we don't want anybody to really know who we are. We hide from people. Jesus knew who Levi was when he called him from the tax collector's booth. Because I'm sure there was a wide berth around it, except for the ones who were going to pay their taxes before they got in trouble with the government. There's nobody in here that waits right up till the very last day, is there? <laughs> or maybe slips a little bit and has to pay a little penalty or, you know, and don't ever want to owe the government a dime. Never. Never, never. Do you know that the people last year who got the ability to file their taxes three months later or whatever it was, the government still charged them a penalty for filing late even though they let them file late? They charged interest on what they owed them until they paid them. The great government! You know, no different than what it was before, but it did, you know, they, they didn't amount to much, I guess, but they still charged them something for it. Well, every time you do something that brings honor and glory to God, there's always somebody there to try to steal it. Isn't there? How many of you know that no good deed goes unpunished? Anybody? There's a, you know, I've told this story before. We had a we had an old maid woman that lived across the street from the church that we were at where we started up Missouri there. And she was part of the church that used to be there. And she didn't have any family. Um, she would call us and tell us every time she thought one of our kids was doing something wrong in the backyard. Mike was out shooting his BB gun one time. He can't be up there shooting his BB gun in the backyard. It might hit the church window. So, you know, I'm not dumb. I set up the target. It wasn't going anywhere. And then one night we had a dinner and we thought, Terry and I thought, well, you know, let's take her some dinner. She can't come across the street. She can't do anything. She had even called me one night because she got stuck on the pot and I had to go over and get her off the pot. <laughs> so we thought, we'll make her some dinner. And the ladies all brought the food that they bring to cook. You know, you can't be back and not eat food. I'm sorry. Just don't work out. <laughs> you know, every time we have a potluck, everybody brings their best deal because nobody wants to go, who made that? Everybody goes, who made that? <laughs> See the difference? Who made that? Who made that? That's really good. Ugh. Ugh. Right? So we got her dinner ready and took it and put foil over it and put it in a nice little box and carried it over to her. Do you know it wasn't a week later that we heard that when she ate it, she was talking to somebody in town, they said, yeah, they brought me dinner, but they didn't bring me any dessert. <laughs> Think about that. I mean, that's what's in people's hearts, and that's what comes out of them. And we don't want to deal with that. We won't have to deal with that. But holier than now people, people who've got bad ideas, sometimes do those things. Look here. In verse um, 16, look at what it says. 
But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Scum. How many know what scum is? It's the nasty stuff you can't get rid of. It's bathtub ring. It's the, you know, the stuff that floats on a pond that makes it so you can't fish in there anymore. It's just scum. Okay? Well, let me tell you. When religious people tell you that you're scum, they are looking in a mirror at themselves because they are no better than you are. How about that? If I'm scum, that's also because God must love it. Jesus died for me. How about that? He died for you? He died for me. I'm no longer scum. I'm a child of the I belong to Jesus Christ. He is my Savior. He's my Lord. I belong to Him. And nothing can change that. Nothing can take that away. But here's my question. If the Pharisees thought that Levi and all his friends and Jesus' disciples and all their friends that were there were so scum, why were they there in the first place? Why were they there? Because they're trying to deny Jesus. They're trying to make it look like Jesus is nobody, that he's a lie, that he's just a stuck rogue. He's really not who he claims to be. He's calling himself the Son of Man, which identifies him as the Messiah. He's forgiven sins, which identifies him as God, right? And they're trying to prove that he's something other than who he is. And as we see this and we look at it, there's always somebody. I mean, I had an old man tell me a long time ago when I first got into ministry. He said, son, he said, in, there, in any church, there's two people who would vote against the cure for cancer if there was one. But they go to the church. Why are they there? Do we need religious people in the church? No. That's why we always tell people, if you don't like what's preached here, don't let the doorknob hit you or the good Lord split you. I'm not a problem with that. I don't beg anybody that says they're needing to leave here to stay. Because if they're not staying because they believe that what we're doing is what God wants, there's no reason for them to be here. And I've had too many people in 28, 29 years I've been in the ministry try to come help me realize that what they were doing at their old church ought to be done in our church. And what my answer there? Go back to the old church. If you like it so much. Don't bring religion to come to the community church. Don't. We don't want it. We know that there are people who need Jesus, and we know that they are not going to find Jesus through religion. They're going to find Jesus through a relationship with him because somebody took the time to invest in their life, and somebody loved God enough to tell them and show them and walk with them, and now they're following Christ. And we want this to be a welcoming place. We want this to be where people can come in with whatever they're carrying and lay it at the foot of Christ and walk out that door just like the man who jumped up off. That's what we want. We want Levi to be able to come in here because he wants to learn about Jesus and follow Jesus and be okay with that. Don't we? Yes. How many of you are here because of that? Yeah. We don't want religion. That's why we don't do the hanging of the greens at Christmas time and we don't do all the Lent, now I'm getting Lent belly button every year because I pick it up the other way. We don't do all that Lent stuff and, you know, we don't do, go out and be debaucherous on Fat Tuesday and live lives like total sinners and then say, God, I'm going to give part of that up for you for the next 40 days and show you how good I am and then pick it right up after 40 days is over. That is absolutely religion and nothing else. Isn't it? Reading somebody else's prayers over and over and over again is absolutely religious. It has nothing to do with a relationship with God. And Jesus said, don't just babble on and on when you're talking to God like the pagans do. Tell him what you need. Tell him what you want. Love him for who he is. He knows what you got. He knows what you need. And these people were real people. And the Pharisees pretended that they weren't real people. I mean, they wore... They had a contest because in the Old Testament it would say, you know, the tassels on your robes and 
where your, the scripture on your forehead and on your wrist and stuff like that. And so they made these little boxes up called phylacteries. And they would put it on their head on a little headband. And they'd walk around with this little wooden box on their head that had one scripture in it. And they'd wear it on their hands. On their, and then they have robes. And then they'd make the, the tassels really long on their robe so that they could really look like they were spiritual. You know, I'm modeling the finest clothes from Gage that you can find. Um, I think I paid $11 for the jeans, and I think I paid 6 bucks for the shirt. You know, my underwear come from the second-hand ones. They don't get the, I don't buy the expensive ones. They're always the blemished ones. So I want you to know that I live just like you do. I walk like you do. I talk like you do. I'm just like you. And you know what? I want us to all be just like Jesus. He wasn't rich. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He was itinerant his whole ministry. He moved from here to there, making a difference for God's kingdom. And we've become too comfortable sitting in one spot, the same. I mean, you know, next week, here's my challenge. Sit somewhere different so I can see if I can remember who you are. Do you know how I remember who wasn't there on Sunday? Guess how I remember who wasn't there on Sunday? I go row to row to row and remember whose butt was in what chair. <laughs> That's how I know if you were there or not this week. But we, we, we get stuck in a rut. We get stuck. When was the last time you took a risk? And just walked up to somebody that you know. I mean, you know, I don't believe in blitzing them all and going out and talking to people and interrupting their day. If you don't know them, I don't believe that ever works. I don't believe it ever lasts. It never makes a difference. But I can tell you, if you sit down and look at it, there are people that you interact with who need Jesus in their life? And if they reject, you go find somebody else to talk to. Invite people to be a part of your life. In order to have friends, you must be friendly. friendly. Right? In order to keep friends, you have to be loyal. And even people who don't know Jesus, if you're a loyal friend, they see that, they hear it, because you're interjecting into the conversation, and they are going to have some time in their life at some point where they say, I've tried everything I can do. Maybe I can talk to Wayne about Jesus that he talks about all the time. Maybe I can talk to Justin about why God's blessing his business so much. You know, as we think about those things, we walk by people every day that need Christ, don't we? Every day. I mean, there was a dude in the window at McDonald's this morning when I went and got my tea. He had a big old red bun on his hair. He had a superwoman mask on. He had long fingernails. But it was a dude. <laughs> he needs Jesus. There's no doubt about it. Nobody's been telling him about a God who loved him. You see, when you say stuff like that, you might get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to do it in an ugly way but that is the epitome of somebody that does not believe that there's God but here's where it really gets twisted some religious people have now determined that what the Bible says is not the only word on things that happen the evangelical Lutheran church in America has now determined and decided that there is no hell now, the evangelical means that they're supposed to be out there sharing the gospel. Okay, that's what an evangelical does, an evangelist. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, whose woman bishop has decided there is no hell, and if there is a hell, that by now it's totally unpopulated. <laughs> Where's Hitler? Where's Osama bin Laden? Where are all Mussolini? Where are Pol Pot? All those people that have killed millions and millions and millions of lives? Where are they? Are they in heaven? No. Well, that, why do we work so hard to live for God if they just get a free chance to go? Right? I don't know if you saw what I put on Facebook about a Methodist church out in the Midwest. It was either in Indiana or Illinois. They now have a openly gay drag queen for a pastor in a Methodist church. The whole Methodist denomination is split in half. Those who want to have that and those who want to stay traditional. Well, actually, it's not just traditional. It's biblical. How is it that the church allows that stuff? But you see, I'm not even talking about those kind of extremes. Anybody ever heard of Hillsong? 
who sings some of their music, right? There was a Hillsong church started down in Dallas. It was there about two years. And they have husbands and wives that are co-pastors. The wife is a pastor, too. Well, guess what? They got caught spending all the church's money, and they got fired for it. So you know what he says he's going to do? He's going to go down the road and start another church. <laughs> because God's okay with that, I guess. Religious people worry about keeping the rules more than they do about understanding that God loves people. There's no love in a religious experience. You know, in the Catholic Church, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You have a relationship with the church. Because if you do what they don't like, they don't communicate you. Right? A lot of other churches are like that. I mean, you let, you, you let somebody fall, well, we see it all the time. Well, it's always in the news. Somebody did something they shouldn't do, and now all of a sudden they're totally disqualified for anything. You know what? Sin is sin where God's concerned. When we have to forgive us, He forgives us. If He didn't, I wouldn't be standing in front of you. God is a loving, forgiving, gracious God. But you know what? He loves people enough to say that it's a fantasy too. He loves people enough to allow them to reject him. He's not going to force himself on anybody. Jesus didn't force himself on Levi. He didn't force himself on the people who were following him. He didn't force himself on the Pharisees. As a matter of fact, he was their reality check. Wasn't he? Let's see what he has to say about it. This little dust up of the religious people, the holier than thou folks, have always stalked Jesus as he became more popular. And religious people demean people and dismiss them. They demean people and they dismiss them. We had a lady in our church when we were in Missouri. Same church, the old lady that didn't get her dessert. Uh, we had a lady who lived with a husband who beat her all the time before we met her. And uh, she divorced him. Because I don't believe God wants that. I don't believe that has anything to do with what God's will is for anybody. And just because she got divorced, she started coming to our church. And some of the old people around town started talking about it. They wouldn't get in, you know, this, this, and this. She's divorced. She's divorced. Hey, you know what? I'm fat. The Bible says blood is a sin, too. <laughs> but God overcomes that, and he lets me be his. And she ended up being a teacher of our fifth and sixth grade kids at that church. And you know what? When we asked her, she cried. She cried. Because nobody wanted her to do anything when she was a part of the other church that was there. And when we asked her, she cried. Do you know why? Because we extended God's grace and God's mercy and God's love to her. And that's what she was looking for. She wasn't belligerent. She just wanted to serve God. And she made a mistake. And God forgives that, doesn't he? When you ask him. When you repent, doesn't he? It's not a fantasy. I don't live a fantasy. My reality is in Christ. I'm surrendered to Christ. That's why I will do and won't do the things that I will do and I won't do. Because I belong to him. And I want to please him. And I want to live for him. And he never forced himself on me. That's why I love God. Well, Jesus kind of puts them in their place. Look at what he says. They say, why does he eat with such scum? In verse 17, when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Now these people aren't, they don't have busted shoulders and cancer and stuff like that. They, they're not, he's not there to be a physician, is he? Even though he's a great physician. He's talking about soul sickness. Soul sickness. Spiritual sickness. That place where people have... The, the, the constant battle that the Bible says we face over what to do and how to do it and should we do this and shouldn't we do that. He said, I came for people who can admit that they don't have it all together. They admit they're sinners. Do you know the Bible says in 1 John that if we say we don't sin, that we call God a liar? You hear that? There's only ever been one person who never sinned in the world, and that's Jesus. And they crucified him for that. We got off pretty scot free, didn't we? They crucified him for never sinning. And here we are sinning all the way up till we find grace. And we don't get crucified for it. His crucifixion covers our sin. God's grace and God's mercy covers my sin. God extended grace and mercy through Jesus to Matthew and his friends and the other people who were following Jesus. 
and they became advocates for him. They became people who made a difference for him. You know, I've told you before, and I want to remind us, because we need to be reminded. Our radio ministry on WCBC, <coughs> this church has not paid one penny for that for the last three years. And it's not because Dave Norman is such a philanthropist. <laughs> you know, people used to come up to me and say, how do you get so much free time on Dave's show? I said, we pay for it. We pay for all the live ads and stuff we do on there. But you know what? Somebody believed in this ministry enough that they paid for the last three years. One person paid for the first two years, and somebody else stepped in this year and paid because they believe in the ministry that we're doing here, and they don't even go to church here. <clears throat> you see, God puts his blessing out when we do what he wants, and sometimes it doesn't always come from people who are a part of us. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't give. We're going to be talking about that a little bit here upcoming. Um, you should give, because at work, worship is involved, involves giving financially, physically, spiritually, all those things, doesn't it? And that's what real worship is. The Pharisees would go through the motions and they thought they were worshiping God. They aren't worshiping God. They're just keeping the rules, keeping the religious practice alive. Who do you think life was more meaningful? Those people who were sinners like Matthew, who followed Jesus and came to know him and had their sins forgiven? Or the religious people who thought they had it all together? Who do you think's life was more meaningful? The ones who got touched by God. Those are the ones whose lives are meaningful. And as you think about it, Jesus made that statement. He was at the house of a guy named Simon the leper. Now, how do you get a name called Simon the leper? How do you get that? He must have had leprosy at one time, right? But it was a Pharisee. And he was at that house, and a woman came in, and everybody knew who she was. Everybody knew who she was. And while Jesus was reclining at the table, she let her hair down, and she began to just weep and sob. Because she knew who she was. And she knew Jesus was the answer. And as she wept, and as she sobbed on Jesus' feet, it says she took her hair, and she wiped her mud off of his feet, the road of grime that was there. And the Pharisees were in the room there, too. And this was their response. It just proves that Jesus is not who he says he is. Because if he knew who was touching him, he would never allow it. And Jesus looked over at him and said, You know what? When I came here, you did not offer me water to wash my hands or my feet. But this woman has been here constantly weeping over my feet and using her hair to wash the dirt off. And he said, let me ask you a question. Yes, her sins are there. And he looked at her and he said, I forgive you of your sins. And then he looked at the Pharisees. Just made him mad. That's not what I was going to say. <laughs> but I better ask, oh, sometimes I can stop before I say what I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> he was going to take them off. He said, who loves more? One who's been forgiven much or one who's been forgiven little? And the answer to that is what? One who's forgiven much. And we understand how much God loves us. When we understand how great His grace and mercy and love is. When we understand that He looked beyond our faults and saw our need. And he called us to himself just like he called Levi. He doesn't call us to religious service. He calls us to walk every day in his presence, knowing that we're going to make mistakes and stand in there offering even more grace and even more mercy when we ask for forgiveness. But you know, sometimes we get to the point where we believe the lies of people. We believe the lies of the devil. We believe the lies we tell ourselves. God will never be able to use me again. Man, I screwed up. I don't know that I can go anywhere around anybody because everybody knows me. No, that's a lie from the devil because I guarantee you, everybody that I've ever talked to, nobody knew what was going on in their life. You know how I know that? Because everybody just worries about their own life. They don't worry about anybody else. They're so consumed with their own life, they don't even really worry about anybody else. But that's a lie from the devil. 
If I thought the devil could, or God couldn't use me because of some things I've done in 28 years of ministry, I wouldn't be standing up here in front of you. Because yes, I have said poo when I didn't even have a mouth full of it. And my flesh was to stink. And I don't always do it the way God wants the first time. But God always has a way of bringing me back, making me what He wants me to be. I've been doing this for a long time, and I still got a lot of rough edges. You know, God's put me under a lot of heat and a lot of pressure, and I'm not a diamond yet. Let me promise you that. Levi wasn't a diamond. The people that followed Jesus weren't. They all made mistakes. He was the only sinless, perfect one. And you know what? Anybody that was willing to come to him, he received. It doesn't say that Jesus went out knocking on doors, talking to people, saying, Hey, you need to come follow me, come follow me. People that followed Jesus were ones who were interested in following him, the ones that God was already working in their life. You know, I think we give up too quick in our world today. We give up too easy. Jesus puts the religious people in their place. Always. He put them in their place. He said, you search the scriptures looking for me and you can't even see me when I'm standing right in front of you. How about that? Let's make a pact this morning. Let's continue as we move past 18 years there to make Cumberland Community Church never be a religious institution again. Ever. It's never been and I don't want it to be. I don't want it to be for the first time. I want us to come here and love God and love each other and find new people that need God and include them into the bunch. You know, we may be in the dictionary one day when you look up dysfunctional religious family. That may be us. But that's okay. Because people can come here and they can find Jesus. And their lives can be changed. And here's what I know. Somebody who's newly found Christ or newly rededicated their life to Christ is always better advertisement than religious people who just sit in the pews and don't do anything. Don't aren't you glad we don't have pews? So none of you fit that category. We don't have pews. But some of you have the same button printing the same chair every week, and I want you to move next week to make sure you, see if you can sit in a different chair. Okay? Every church has its way of doing things, but let's never be religious. Everybody all right with that? Yes. Everybody all right with loving each other? Yes. Everybody all right with accepting people as they come? Yeah, that's who we need to be. Um, you know, when Matthew fell so loud of Jesus, he wrote a book about it. Didn't he? He wrote a whole book about it. He researched Jesus back to his birth, and he walked it all the way through until Jesus died. And he continued to follow Jesus after Jesus resurrected. Let's be that way. Let's let God work in our lives so that we can become everything he wants us to be. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your amazing love, and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, I pray that as we've heard this story today, that uh, we would stick closely to the memories that we have of when we were lost. You found us. When we surrendered, you saved us. And when you saved us, you gave us the ability to do everything that we need to do that's pleasing in your sight, and that's what we need to focus on. God, help us not to compromise with sin. Help us not to be afraid of people who are living sinful lives, but also not to get tangled up in their, their inability to even believe that you exist. Father, help us to keep our integrity as Christians and help us to seek and save those who are lost. We seek them and find them and bring them in and you save them. Not up to us to save them, Father, but we just find them and give them hope and let you work in their lives. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this beautiful day. And I pray that as we sing this song and go out, that we would go out refreshed and renewed and, and invigorated, looking for the opportunity to talk to whomever it is that you send in front of us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing together this morning.